Hey fellow a and nerds, welcome back to a and Nerd Headquarters. For this little description, I like to call, Hey, let's draw an osteon. So I don't create this video as a way to explain to you bone anatomy or anything like that. So as you look at my little picture, if you're not sure what the periosteum is, figure that out first from your a and lecture, then come back to this video. So in this video, I'm going to try to describe just a little bit about how bone forms, how it's created by these osteoblasts, and what happens during the development of this osteon. So what you can see here is I've made a rather bad sketch of the periosteum showing the fibrous layer in orange, which you may already know is just basically dense irregular connective tissue, and I can see in gray the inner, which would face the bone, layer called the cellular layer. So the bone would actually be over here. This is the direction that we're going. And that cellular layer is composed of what are called osteochondral progenitor cells. Or you may see them by their slightly more modern name, osteogenic cells. I prefer the bigger mouthful, osteochondral progenitor cells, because these cells right here, these cells can become either osteoblasts, bone-making cells, or chondroblasts, cartilage-making cells, depending on what sort of chemical signals they get. So for our discussion, they will be becoming osteoblasts, that will be their last step in dif differentiation. But at other times, in other locations, say in a tissue we would call perichondrium, these same cells would be becoming chondroblasts. So again, I like the bigger name osteochondral progenitor cells because that reflects the fact that these cells have two possible differentiation routes that they could take. But let's you and I talk about what happens when these cells become an osteoblast. So in the periosteum or in the endosteum, which would really just be these cells right here, the osteochondral progenitor cells would be the endosteum. So let's talk about what happens when one of these cells takes its last step in differentiation becoming what we would call an osteoblast. So here's this same cell. I will label, let's say now it is an osteoblast cell. An actively producing bone-making cell. Now these osteoblast cells have lots and lots and lots of endoplasmic reticula. I bet you've heard of that before. I'd be surprised if you hadn't. And on that endoplasmic reticulum, of course, many, many ribosomes. So these are very active producing cells. And they do what? They actively produce bony matrix, the extracellular matrix of bone. So here in red, I've laid out all those ribosomes, see? So these cells, the osteoblasts, well, well, what do you think that they release? What do you think that they spit out? Do you think it's hard pieces of mineralized bone? No, that wouldn't be possible. Because what's a cell? It's a little ooey-gooey piece of, you know, semi-liquid cytoplasm with some nice lipid cell membrane like that. If this cell actually produced a piece of hard, spiky hydroxyapatite inside the cell and then tried to get it out of the cell, that would pretty much destroy the cell. They do not release fully formed or fully mineralized bone. What they release is a material we call osteoid. bone-like, bone-ish, sort of bone material. Osteoid is released by these cells 
which would contain pro-collagen. These cells don't even release entire collagen. Now, I don't know if you knew this. Connective tissue cells don't even release whole collagen fibers. They release smaller pro-collagen fibers, which are then assembled into collagen outside the cell. And what connective cells release collagen? Pretty much all of them except for blood do that. But technically speaking, it's pro-collagen that is released. We would also see the release of a whole bunch of calcium ions, a whole bunch of phosphates, for the chemistry lovers and phosphates, and a great big bunch of enzymes released by these cells. I'm just trying to pick a good color here. How about pink? And a whole bunch of enzymes are released. The enzymes functioning sort of as the tools that assemble these things into collagen fibers and then mineralize bone later on. So this material right here Pro-collagen, proteins, calciums, phosphates, enzymes, and other things. This is osteoid. This is what these cells release into their environment. And then bony matrix is assembled outside the cell. In fact, it doesn't happen instantly. When people like me say that an osteoblast is a very active bone producing cell. It is very active, but I don't think anybody said anything about it's very fast. It's going to take a good two weeks, 15 days or so, before the bone actually starts mineralizing into what you and I would think of as bony matrix. So if I pan down a little bit, so various enzymes will assemble collagen fibers. Other enzymes will start the formation of the bony matrix, which will start to mineralize, harden, along the collagen fibers. So again, this is going to be, you know, a good 15 days, three weeks, four weeks, we're going on and on, and this bone is starting to mineralize, and I'm forming hydroxyapatite, I hope you see, along this collagen fiber. Hydroxyapatite is the mineral name, I've dropped it a couple times already, hydroxyapatite of that inorganic part of bone. I would imagine in your course you have to memorize the chemical structure, which is typically expressed this way, CA10PO46OH2. This is hydroxyapatite, the mineral part of bone. So it gets laid down, mineralized, calcified, crystallized along this embedded collagen fiber. So there's a collagen fiber in there, I'll show you with dashed lines, like so. And again, this is going to take several weeks. And in dense bone, or compact bone, what we see is our original osteoblast, right here, starting to get surrounded by bony matrix. So I'll erase this just because my fancy tablet lets me do that. So this osteoblast secretes, releases, spits out osteoid. Collagen fibers form like this give it enough time, we start to get mineral deposits of hydroxyapatite around the collagen fibers. I'm hope, trying to use lots of colors here. I hope this stands out for you as you see it. And 
What we end up with, I hope you get the impression here because my art isn't fast enough, that this osteoblast is surrounding itself with mineralized bony matrix over time. And this continues on and on and on and on like this. Collagen fibers, bony matrix, hydroxyapatite forming along the collagen fibers. But what I want you to be aware of is that I end up with these gaps between the deposits of hydroxyapatite. See that? Little gaps. So over time, what will happen is this osteoblast right here, this thing, the osteoblast, becomes an osteocyte because its production of osteoid is going to slow down over time. The cell will change size a little bit. It will change appearance a little bit over time. Sort of even looking a little bit like a starfish with little projections like this that poke through these gaps right here. So here's my now osteocyte. Maybe I can do this a little so bony matrix forming all over here, right? Little gaps where these cell projections are and bony matrix all over the place here with little collagen fibers in there, right? Remember we form collagen fibers that are inside this bony matrix that the hydroxyapatite forms on. So once it's pretty much surrounded itself, the cell, with bony matrix, it's now an osteocyte. It slows down its production, but it is still able to communicate with its environment through these little gaps right here. So now let's take a look at an entire osteon. An osteon is that thing that you may have seen in your lab or your lecture that looks a whole heck of a lot like a target. And the only reason we say it looks like a target is because it looks like a target. Growth rings in a tree, something like that. And because of the way it's stained, you often see these little spots in the rings of my target. I'm just drawing some out here, so bear with me. Hope you don't mind me taking some time for the art. And I use that term very loosely here, everybody. So these little chambers are where the osteocytes live, like that. Here's an osteocyte, here's an osteocyte, here's an osteocyte, like that. I guess I drew too many chambers because now I have to fill them all in, don't I? There's a little osteocyte, osteocyte, osteocyte. These are the bone cells that have slowed down their production of osteoid. They still make it, they can still make it, they just don't make that much of it, and they would have little cytoplasmic extensions going out like this through those gaps in the bony matrix. Almost resembling a starfish. I'll get there, sorry. I drew too many lacunae. Lacunae are the chambers that the osteocytes live in. I'll say that again. Lacunae, these are the chambers that the osteocytes live in. Lacunae, those are the chambers that these osteocytes are in. Lamellae, those are the rings 
that you see. So here is a lamella, singular. I'll just make it singular. Lamella, that's the ring of bone. Lacunae, the little hollow chamber where the osteocyte lives after it's surrounded itself with bony matrix, right? And the very middle, the bullseye of this target, you may recall from your lab, if you saw it in your lab, called the central canal, sometimes a haversion canal, but most people go with central canal. And the bullseye of this target, this is where I would find, typically, a vein and an artery supplying goodies to all these osteocytes. Because you have to remember, these are living cells, aren't they? That still need oxygen, still need to get their glucose, and so on. And we would see many what appear to be small little cracks here amongst the bone called canaliculi, little tiny canals that make a network here that connect these various osteocytes or bone cells to one another and the nearest blood vessel. So the bone tends to look like it's got a bunch of little cracks in it. Those aren't little cracks, those are just tiny canals allowing goods and services, we could say, to go to these osteocytes. And then we would see all this bony matrix in here like that. Bony matrix, bony matrix, bony matrix, bony matrix, like this. In fact, I'll draw it all in and just fast forward to where I'm done. So here you see my osteon. I've doctored it up a little bit. So I can see the bony matrix. I can see my little tiny canals. I can see my lacunae with the osteocytes living in there. So the osteocytes are essentially maintaining this bony matrix. And you've seen this before, I'll bet, in your lab and in your lecture, this structure that looks like a target called an osteon. But seeing it in this two-dimensional picture is typically not enough for us to understand the actual strength of human bone because human bone is really, really strong. So if I did the same thing again a little lower here in a blank spot, and let's take those lamellae, and I'm going to give it my best shot here, people, and those rings of bone and look for a picture like this one that's in your textbook, I would not be surprised at all if you have one where the osteon is telescoped out, I like to call it, something like this, so I can see individual lamellae like this sort of exploded out. Let me shrink this up a little bit and maybe draw another one in here for you. So the thing to think about, and again, look for a picture like this in your textbook because it'll probably look better than any picture I can make here. I'm just giving it my best shot, everyone. So remember, I have my osteocytes, the cells, like so. And these are the cells that originally were the osteoblasts, laying out that osteoid. Now they're osteocytes. They still throw out osteoid, but a much slower rate of production. Like that, with their cellular projections, remember, sort of like starfish, right? And what happens as we start to apply forces to our bone, the osteoid that's laid down, and remember this isn't fast, this is taking weeks and longer. So just two weeks for the hydroxyapatite to start mineralizing everybody. And let's throw a couple more right here. These are the bone cells, the osteocytes. And then in the very center, of course, I would have artery. 
and vein, vein and blue artery in that central canal, right? Now, the collagen fibers, as the bone develops, start to orient in a regular pattern, provided that we are putting force on this bone. A phrase that I always tell people to remember is that bone is a composite dynamic living tissue that changes as a result of the forces acting on it. A composite dynamic living tissue that changes as a result of the forces acting on it. I want you to think about what it is that I just said. So bone is always changing. And if I lay down a bunch of hydroxyapatite along these collagen fibers in this ring or lamella, and just to keep us honest, let's label. So this is a lamella, a ring of bone. Here's another lamella. Plural, I'd put an E at the end, lamella, like that. In the next lamella, the collagen fibers would be going in a different direction, like this. And then in the next one, guess what? A different direction still, like that. And then if I throw some hydroxyapatite down as it mineralizes, right? Let me go a little bigger. As it mineralizes here along the bone, what I end up with is essentially like concrete reinforced with rebar, those iron bars. This makes this osteon a very, very strong cylinder. These things are often described as strong weight-bearing cylinders, strong columns of bone, pillars of bone, something like that. So again, remember the orientation of my collagen fibers amongst this hydroxyapatite. Opposing. This makes an osteon a pretty strong pillar of bone that is able to withstand a typically large amount of force. Think about this when you learn about how strong bone is. So if in dense bone, I had an osteon right here, really strong opposing cylinders of bone, right? And another one right here, and another one right here in the dense bone. I think you get the idea. I end up with a massively powerful piece of engineering with a bunch of very strong cylinders because of this opposing orientation of these collagen fibers that can bear a lot of weight. They can have a very huge compressive strength. This is the nature of bone. Now, this is all happening in dense bone or compact bone. But guess what? In those trabeculae of spongy bone, those are pretty much osteons too. I invite you in your textbook to find a trabeculous singular picture in spongy bone and look closely at it and you will notice that it is also basically an osteon. So we can create these really, really powerful cylinders of bone, starting with osteoid, forming collagen fibers and mineralizing the hydroxyapatite bony matrix along those collagen fibers in one ring of bone, one direction, the next ring of bone, a different direction, making a very, very strong, powerful cylinder. Take some time and think about it. Hopefully this will help you understand it just a little bit. And if it doesn't, then I suggest, hey, maybe you should draw your own osteon. There's the osteon.